my name is Matt Conti. Um, I'm a resident here in the North End on Commercial Street, and I also have to be the editor of northendwaterfront.com, and I've been to um, a lot of the Boston Harbor Association meetings and events, and that's how I've gotten to know Julie Worm. So we're very pleased to have here, and it's really great that they're reaching out to the neighborhoods and the communities. And as those of you that know the Boston Harbor Association, you know that they were the leading advocate for the whole cleanup of the harbor, which I think we're all very happy is largely done, as well as the Harbor Walk, which is 47 miles, and pretty much get, getting there, almost done as well. And uh, they've really taken on now, you know, the next challenge in the harbor, and that's, you know, rising sea tides that we're all gonna deal with and repairing the Boston and the, the neighborhoods around it. Just a little bit about uh, Truly. Truly joined the Boston Group Association in 2011. And before that, and she is the executive, executive director. So she took uh, Vivian Lee's position. Vivian became president of there, of the association. And uh, Vivian wished she could be here. In fact, she sent me a, a very thoughtful email today saying that um, oh, she really wanted to be there. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> if you know Vivian, you know, she doesn't stop. So she has, you know, many things going on today. She's also a sitting member of the Boston Conservation Commission, which is having a hearing tonight. They're also dealing with a wetlands ordinance for the city, a proposed wetlands ordinance, ordinance doing a listening session on that, that otherwise she would have definitely have, um, have been here. Uh, but Julie also is, is, is the expert on sea level rise. Before the Boston Harbor Association, she served as the New England Regional Director of the Oceana Program for the Environmental Defense Fund and she managed regional policy programs for the Appalachian Mountains Club and Wilderness Society. Uh, so the, it's, it's really been, and she also has taken the Boston Harbor Association, they have a brand new website, they're doing fun things too, which is nice, Summer on the Waterfront, go to the, the website, summeronthewaterfront.org, and it's just, it got relaunched about a week ago, and it has all the events, including a lot here um, in the neighborhood. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julie, but I think we're going to do something a little bit um, techy on the question side. We'll still take questions at the end in the regular format, but uh, we're going to use a, uh, take out your smartphones. Everyone have a smartphone now? All right, take out your iPhone on there. And if you go to this website, generalq.com slash tie. So it's generalq.com slash tie. Right, it's also yes, right up here. Questions. Yeah, like general questions, it's at just the queue.com slash chi. You can ask, as Julie's talking, you can type in a question there, and then every uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so, we'll stop and take the first two questions. You can also vote for your question that you want to answer, so we'll just take the one questions that people really want to be answered. All right? And we're gonna take questions the other old fashioned way as well. So. What's a smartphone? There we go. to ask questions any any way you want. Um, but we were we were um, playing with this this uh, format thinking it might be fun. So um, in February, the Bo thank you very much Matt and all of you for coming. Um, in February the Boston Harbor Association released this report which is available for free on our website. TBHA.org is the website. Um, as our uh, sea level rise maps, if you want to look more closely at the neighborhood. Um, this report was not a wake-up call. Really, Sandy was the wake-up call. This is really designed to say, okay, how does one respond to the threat of a next Hurricane Sandy or, over the long term, um, a baseline higher ocean level? So what this report does, and we've released it um, in a press conference with the mayor, and, and Mayor Menino and his staff have done terrific work um, working to prepare the city at a policy level um, for rising sea level. So he basically said, this is what I want to do, including this new wetlands regulation. And we said, and here's how one might think about sea level rise adaptation. So the first thing we did is we looked at all of Boston and said, what areas flood? sorry, the flood's here. Um, the second thing is then say, okay, if you know you're in a flood zone, um, what do you do about it and how do you decrease your risk in the short term and over time? And then because flooding, as we know from a day like today, is not always, how do you create solutions that also um, really provide other benefits like wonderful social space? 
So Superstorm Sandy uh, was one of the largest storms ever to hit the East Coast. A typical hurricane is 300 miles long. This was 1,000 miles long and then ran into a nor'easter, which is why it, it took a sharp left and hit New York City and um, sorry, New York City and New Jersey. So um, it affected. So where it did hit hard, it affected our transportation systems, cultural icons, the electrical grid, residential areas. But this didn't happen in Boston, as we know. So this is a picture of Long Wharf um, during Hurricane Sandy, and this level of flooding, as I'm sure you know already, this already happens during wicked high tides a couple times a year. So this actually more had to do with the flooding during the full moon tide of that day, because Hurricane Sandy hit at low tide, not high tide, the, the storm surge from Sandy. So we really dodged a bullet. But the point is, we didn't dodge a bullet by 400 miles, we dodged it by five and a half hours, uh, because had Sandy hit at high tide, we actually would have had a 100-year flood. If Nemo had hit at high tide, we would have had a, a second 100-year flood in four months. So these are storms that are starting to get more, more common. So coastal flooding is a combination. And again, you're gonna, this, some of this presentation is going to be very familiar to you as coastal residents. Some will be new. So coastal flooding happens twice, well, why, why do we get more ocean water so that it comes and spills over our infrastructure? First of all, twice a month we get an extra um, high tide during the full moon and during the new moon. And then a few times a year we get what we call a wicked high tide or king tide, um, where you, know, you just get an extra high tide and that is natural and that's astronomical. Um, when there's a storm and there's an onshore breeze, that wind breeze, high wind, that wind pushes water onto land and as it hits a solid object like a seawall, it goes up. Um, so a storm surge will add to the amount of water and or you have underlying sea level rise. Now I have a nine-year-old daughter, she doesn't take her quite as much as she used to, but I was thinking about sea level rise as I was watching her have a giant tantrum in the bathtub. And so you think about a bathtub, if there is this much water in the bathtub and a giantly tantruming child, you'll get a little bit of flooding. If you have a very calm child and a very full bathtub, you'll get a little bit of flooding. But that day I had a full bathroom and a giantly tantruming child, and our bathroom was soaked. So when you think about the difference between, or the interplay between underlying water level and the amount of storm happening. Essentially, over time, you need smaller and smaller storms to flood. And that's what we're preparing for. The Hurricane Sandy's today, the you know, future high tides of 100 years from now. I think the other, thing, the other point I want to make is there's, to make the distinction between flooding and catastrophic flood damage. We're not able to hold back the tide we are able to prevent catastrophic flood damage. And I want us to uh, think about those two as, as separate issues. So this is, I took off the units because this graph was actually too conservative, but I, this just gives you a sense of what we know. So this is before, um, we've, we've had about 150 years of pretty accurate measurements of the tide. This before then is, is uh, more estimates based on indirect data. We have this data here in the Boston area. We've had about a, a foot of high, a, a foot of sea level rise over the last um, 100 years. Half of that was natural uh, because of land sinking, um, and that would have happened anyway. Half of that, or six inches, was uh, from climate change. And then there's this broad range of um, estimates of how much sea level rise we'll have over the, the coming century. That estimate is sensitive more to our future behavior than to scientific modeling. So that range is basically based on how well we do on mitigation in terms of preventing additional um, temperature rise. But the best science today says that as we have had a foot of sea level rise over, since the late 1800s, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, is starting to accelerate. By mid-century, 
um, best science says between uh, uh, one and two feet of, sea, of baseline sea level rise, that bathtub level. By the end of the century, between three and six feet of sea level rise. The thing that's kind of gloomy is that every new estimate um, has that number go up, not down. And that, um, again, as I mentioned, the uncertainty is based on really future behavior less than scientific uncertainty. Um, and I want to actually pause and, and mention, this report was done in collaboration with really world-class climatologists, Paul Kirschen of uh, University of New Hampshire, Ellen Douglas, and Chris Watson from UMass Boston. The three of them have been behind every climate change report done for New England, whether it was for Union of Concerned Scientists, National Oceanogra Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, Mass Department of Transportation of the City of Boston. They're the modelers. So all of the science in here was not from Boston Harbor Association. It was from these uh, universities, university scientists. And they are very cautious because climatologists, gets, they get hammered. It's a very politicized uh, field. So this um, is today's high tide plus um, two and a half feet of, of additional ocean water. Um, if you see this yellow, this is in fact what happened during um, Hurricane Sandy and Blizzard Nemo. So when you're talking about, you were mentioning there's a little bit of flooding, it was higher. We actually get this amount of flooding um, a couple times a year. And that happened during Nemo and Sandy. So you see around the historic wharves, a little bit of flooding around the North End and Charlestown, a little bit of flooding, certainly more sea boulevard floods at this level. So um, so the yellow right there, those are the three coast bird wharfs, right? Yeah. And then the yellow that's right there, that's this property and... and no, the, that's a long up, wharf. Up, that's the aquarium. Up. Up. up, up yes. See the three coast bird wharfs? Yes. Yeah. That's us. And then the yellow is us. Yeah. Um, Except we actually yeah. didn't flood. Well, I, you know what? Some of you know North End better than I. Where are we? What is that yellow? That's the longer wars. That's not Reyes. That? Well, what did flood was I took pictures where the around the ball fields, yeah, you know, walkway. that whole walkway back there flooded on onto the fields. But even okay. so, this was up to two feet. So yellow is up to two feet of flooding. It's minor flooding. Okay. So this is what happened. This is what actually happened during the season. This is an We had much more flooding. We did. Then, okay, so what this is, is this is elevation flooding. If you had more flooding, it was from wave action. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, right, so this is basically... Well, I'm just trying to make sure that people... So this is not overestimating, yes. Right. So this is literally, like, if you're talking about a bathtub model. It's just showing versus elevation. It's not showing wind and waves. So you can certainly get additional flooding. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, good point. So this is what would have happened had Sandy and Nemo hit at high tide. Um, which again, you know, five and a half hours different. And that's, um, yeah, so you're seeing again some flooding around the north end. The innovation district gets clobbered. I mean, that's a lot of fill. Basically, one of the things you'll, you'll notice is the sea reclaims its own um, pretty quickly. So the, the uh, filled areas of Boston are the first to flood. Um, so again, um, yellow is zero to two feet. Um, the darker colors are either two to four feet four to six feet, and blue is um, six feet or more. Mm -hmm. to green. Um, no, I think that's the two to four. That's two to four feet. Yeah. And then like that's that's six feet. Unfortunately, we have orange and pink, and they don't, it's hard to tell them apart. You mentioned blue. I don't see any blue up there. There's just like a little blue here. They're like low-lying areas. It's a little blue here, blue here. <laughs> you know, they're, they're below grade areas. So um, had, we, had we had, again, had Sandy hit at high tide, we could have seen, and this is, this is our 100-year flood zone, by the way. So a 100-year flood zone doesn't mean you get one of these floods and you're good to go for another century. It means that, unfortunately, it means that you have a 1% chance in a given year, on average, of getting one of these floods. And um, so this is the area where we currently 
see this is a 100-year flood zone. That is 7% of the city of Boston. So the current 100-year flood. But remember we said with sea level rise of 2 to 3 feet by mid-century, that becomes on average the annual flood by mid-century. And what's, what has really had me grief since I've been understanding this is that's a twice daily high tide turn of the century under current estimates. Maybe it's 2120, maybe it's 2150, maybe it's um, 2090, but it's sooner than later. And that's a different city when you're talking about that being the high tide. It doesn't mean that this will flood. It means that we have to change our infrastructure for that not to flood twice a day. So what floods at high tide plus five feet? I've been really trying to not call this the inundation district because this really does inundate. It's very flat and it has billions of dollars of fantastic new development, including our office in the uh, fourth district. Um, so, uh, you know, my feet are constantly wet from a lot of small amounts of flooding. The Bayside Expo Center, uh, which is uh, was just purchased by UMass Boston for, for new dorms. Children's Museum. Uh, the uh, World Shaving Headquarters of Gillette, and, and truly Gillette makes all its razors on the Fort Point Channel. The Navy Yard, and and really, with this level of flooding, you've seen the uh, the sculpture uh, or the, the etching of the original um, shoreline between Fainalong and City Hall. That's five feet of, that's you know what happens at that flood level. You would see salt water puddles um, almost touching City Hall. It goes all the way through Fainalong Hall. Okay, so this is a super scary, super scary but unlikely um, today. This is today's high tide plus seven and a half feet. Okay, that means Hurricane Sandy hitting at high tide in mid century, right? It takes more and more and more things to align to get this kind of flooding. But the caveat um, New York City got a nine foot storm surge at high tide, right? So this is this is no longer, this is essentially what Boston would have looked like had we had Hurricane Sandy like flooding, right? Because this is um, 12 and a half feet of flooding above mid tide and Sandy had 13 and a half feet of flooding above mid tide. So um, that's close to what happened in New York City. That's what that's what Sandy in New York City kind of looks like in Boston. Um, but, so, so the yeah. The cafe floods through the, the last hole, is that it? What happens is it, it overtops the Charles River Dam. So that's at a le so if you think of sea level, that's really mid tide. So Charles River Dam is eleven feet above mid tide. This is twelve and a half feet above mid tide. So, you know, again, for us, it's gonna take a giant storm to get here, and yet this is essentially the equivalent of New York City. So this is really flooding over 30% of Boston, as you're mentioning. That includes overtopping the Charles River Dam. The good part, though, is the Charles River Dam has giant pumps sending water back over. So that's really, you know, only at high tide are you really getting that level of water coming over. And as soon as the tide drops, you, you're able to push a lot of water back. But again, the thing that is, um, is sobering is that over time this gets more and more possible, right? So this is a quite rare flood event, almost you know, 500 year flood event today. But over time, with that baseline sea level going up, it gets less rare. So this is a hundred year flood by 2050. This is on average the annual flood by 2100. Again, without change, that's a very different city. So what floods at that level? This is where our infrastructure floods. Logan Airport is at six feet above high tide. Um, the Conley uh, Container Port is, is similarly situated. So this is where all our commerce is taking place. This is, these are the downtown wharves, East Boston and South Boston. But again, this, this is a, this is a um, picture of the aquarium tea stop, which I'm going to pick on in a moment. But that's during Nemo. They had read the report and they said, I think we need some sandbags. 
of the accordion. So good for them. They're already adapting. So what can we do? So that was a, oh my gosh, here's, what, here's what's coming. This is, okay, how can we, how can we, we uh, deal with this um, rationally and mindfully? So um, all of this, these recommendations are right in our report. In, in fact, right in the executive summary, again, available for free on our website. So um, we had suggestions for both the public sector, predominantly the city and the state, and the private sector. So the city of Boston actually has a quite good climate action plan. It's been focused on prevention until now. They're coming out with a new plan focused on adaptation for 2014. So certainly, I'm sure Matt will keep an eye on those public hearings for people to go out and talk about it. The flood zone maps we have currently in Boston are based on retrospective rainfall from FEMA. They're used for annual um, insurance rates. They're perfectly appropriate to use on an annual basis. They're no longer appropriate to use as on a planning basis as our, as our sea level is no longer static. So the um, city of Boston is coming out with new flood zone maps that take into account sea level rise. So that's terrific that they're doing that. And then within that flood zone, um, people who own their buildings and expect to own them long term, whether it's university, whether it's Spalding Rehab, they already are thinking about um, adaptation, and they're, and they're building in um, those preventative measures. A lot of our buildings where businesses um, expect to flip them after within a decade, they have a disincentive to fully prepare their buildings and spend that money. So one of the things that we can do to basically level the, rate, the market uh, playing field is for all buildings um, in the in the flood zones to, to have the building cones be focused on resilience of saying how can those buildings not be damaged separating the difference between flooding and flood and catastrophic flood damage so um, providing building codes to to prevent um, harm from happening and then there's a real um, need for the public sector to assist landowners uh, building owners to overcome barriers to action whether that is capital uh, Bridge loans, or um, or again regulatory markets for the large commercial buildings, or uh, information. In the private sector, um, don't wait for the city to tell you what to do. <laughs> right, right away. Look at you know, look at your building. What's the lowest line? Why? Do you, like, what's going to flood, and do you care? Is the issue. So Logan Airport. So so the runways flood. So what? Well, nobody's going to be flying dur during a hurricane, but they care if their electrical systems flood, they care if the terminals flood. So you figure out if it's going to flood, basically what elevation is my building, how high above sea level, and if it floods, so what? And if, it, and if I do care about floods, how do, what is my emergency management strategy for preventing flooding of things that don't want to flood the salt water? Over time, you're going to go from worrying about storms to worrying, worrying about more chronic flooding. How do you, as you um, do improvements over time, just as you have to replace your roof over time or an elevator in a larger building, whatever, you incorporate this preparedness planning into maintenance to make it cheaper and to keep up with, this, with the same level of risk over time. And then in places where, for example, the electrical kit grid comes into a private building, working with um, the city uh, and public sector to make sure that you know you've protected your building. You still want energy. You still want electricity. So how do you protect the infrastructure as well? So this is an example of a, a preparedness plan. This is one of the case studies we looked at in the report. We also looked at UMass Boston. Um, this is the Marriott Hotel in Long Wharf, right? Um, Right here is that aquarium tea station, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, so I don't want you to worry at all about the words on this. <laughs> okay. So this is what a very densely written preparedness plan looks like as, as prepared by a uh, civil engineer. And when I have a moment, I will make it a little more understandable. The thing that is least understandable is that as you go down in the chart, flooding increases. That's completely counterintuitive. But what these numbers are, this is number, this is four feet 
and the four stands for feet above mid tide. Down here is 16 feet above mid tide. Okay. So um, and then this this is basically how much how high will the how high will the high tide twice daily high tide be over time? So today the twice daily high tide is five feet above mid tide. In 2050, it's going to be up to seven feet above high tide. In 2100, it's going to be up to 11 feet, I'm sorry, above mid tide as, as a maximum. So basically, this is saying how high will the twice daily high tide be over time? And there's bigger uncertainty, right, over time. We know how much it is today. We're not totally certain how much it will be at the turn of the century. This is how high the annual storm on average is going to be. This is how high the um, the 100-year uh, storm is, is predicted to be. You'll see, this will make a lot more sense the next slide. But green means I don't have to do anything. Orange means I have to do something to my building. Um, yellow is I need to do something on a neighborhood level. Red is I should really go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so here's the poor old tea station, right? This, this tea right here. And the, and the, oh, the front door, the uh, opening to the tea station is at seven and a half feet um, above mid tide, or two and a half feet above high tide. Okay, so one way to, to use this very densely packed preparedness plan is to say, do I care today? If, I, if my front door is at seven and a half feet above mid tide today, do I care? Okay, I don't care about the tide. I'm fine. Don't have to do anything with the high tide. All right, in the, uh, the annual tide, um, which is two and a half feet above uh, sea level, all right, I get a little wet, which you saw with that picture in, uh, in Blizzard Nemo. But not a big deal. You know, the, you're not going to get tremendous flooding. But the tea station today is not prepared for the 100-year flood today. So that's one thing you learn from this kind of plan. So will the tea stop running because the yes. electricity will well, imagine, you know, the aquarium tea station, you open up and you're right down, yeah. right? And so... So, will the electricity in the tea be... Uh, that? They will have closed the tea by then. Yeah, my, my sense of it is, so if we, if Sandy was predicted to hit right at Boston, they probably would have closed down the tea, shut off the electricity, moved all of the, the cars to somewhere higher. Which is what New York did, um, but what you want to do just for for this this T stop and, is and, and actually how long was New York the subways closed down? I'm taking the, the subways. So yeah, yeah, I don't know the answer. It's a surprisingly short amount of time. I would have thought it would be yeah. It was well, like yeah, Bloomberg. Right? No, it depends on the route. Okay. Do you know the answer for that? Some of them were just a couple of days. Yeah, it's about three days. a couple of days. Yeah. It's about three days. Oh, but compared to the anywhere. but compared to the amount of water, you know. So mm -hmm. I was. I was surprised at how quick it was. Um, and part of it was they did a lot of really good um, preparedness planning. So, so what you learned from this today is that the tea today is not prepared for a 100-year flood. Or it, you know, it, it would experience flooding during the 100-year flood. They would have well, to do something. And, and do you want to pay another dollar on every tea ticket? <laughs> but I mean, again, a 100-year flood, you can sandbag that, right? If that's just, you know, you say, OK, nobody's getting off the aquarium tea stop. We'll have buses. Or just, you know, you can sandbag today. But here's the other question. You can use a, a plan like this, is basically, when will, when do I have to care? When does my spot have to care? So again, um, picking on the 14. So in, 20, 20, in 2010, or basically today, um, I have to worry just slightly about the annual flood. It's not really a big deal for me. By mid-century, um, I'm going to need to sandbag for the annual flood, so at least once a year I'm going to have to deal with sandbags. By mid-century, you know, I'm looking at five feet of water at the tea stop, and that's going to be pretty hard to, to sandbag against. So then you say, okay, my choices are either to, by mid-century, move or elevate the, uh, the aquarium tea entrance, but then let's look at the 100-year storm surge. If I'm looking at a 100-year flood event, and I'm already looking at two and a half feet of water today, there were five feet of water mid-century, and eight feet of water by the turn of the century. If I'm the T, I'm moving that rather than fussing with it, right? So 
you can imagine, so what this says to the T is they look at all of the elevations of their stops, of their uh, maintenance yards, and say, what do I need to move or, or change? That's what a preparedness plan does. It's not like, oh my god, i got to sell. It's, do I need to get rid of my basement door? Do I need to, you know, elevate my electrical outlets? You know, there's smaller actions you take to maintain the same level of risk over time. Because there's other things you want to spend money on, essentially. So when you're looking at cost-effective preparedness plans, think of us like San Francisco. They have to prepare for earthquakes in a way we don't have to. We're not having to deal with sea level rise in a way that Worcester doesn't have to, right? Um, and so now we're saying, what, what do we do? So robustness means today I'm putting up the 20-foot tall sea dam across the island. That's a robust plan. No one in our lifetimes, you know, no one here is going to deal with flooding if you have something like an incredibly high uh, seawall. And then we have no money for anything else, right? That, that would be a, an enormous uh, uh, sink of money. Flexibility is basically saying, look, I have a 100-year flood zone today. How do I maintain the same level of risk over time by increasing my actions over time? That's the idea of a flexible time. So you say basically, hey, if I'm going to need this as a flood zone, maybe I don't build really expensive, fragile buildings on it. I'm going to keep it as open space until it becomes something else. No regret and co-benefit solutions. I'm going to talk a lot more about that. It's the idea of maintaining a livable city. And then um, saying, how can we, in increasing our flood protection, also increase the value of the area um, so that we enjoy it? So in the 99.9% .9 of the time we're not flooded, it's a beautiful amenity also. And then the idea of resilience versus resistance. There are many places, like um, a ground floor parking garage, like Logan Airport runways, that are perfectly floodable, like the Harbor Walk. Not a problem if it floods. Water comes in, water goes out, it's fine. Resistance, uh, so resilience means how quickly can, can you come back after a, a flood, Res, a, a saltwater flood. Resistance is there are places that cannot flood, the Museum of Fine Arts, an intensive care unit, you know, where you really don't want water. How do I keep water out of those? And that's a smaller area. So Spalding gets um, a lot of credit, and deservedly so, for being pre-adapted very thoughtfully to, um, to rise in sea level. And they didn't intentionally do this originally. They got caught in the financial credit crunch, and they had to stop um, their building for several years. And they said, you know, while we're just sitting here, why don't we see what we can learn from Katrina? And so. The things that they did, one was they have openable windows, because one of the problems with the hospitals in New Orleans is they, they couldn't open the windows, so it became an incredibly hot place when the generators failed. They put all their mechanical equipment up on the roof. Um, there's nothing critical on the first floor, so that's a resilient building, right? Even if it does flood, not a big deal. And then all of their key floors are above the 100-year the flood in 2085. So they're good to go for quite some time. I want to mention some ideas of living with water. You know, this, then this is the idea of, of resilience. So Chung Chung Channel is in, um, I know I didn't pronounce that right, but I don't really know that. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is Korean. so this is um, Seoul, Korea. And this is their big dig. So they had the same thing that we had with an elevated highway that was a blight that really sort of dampened the, the neighborhood around it. In their case, they had a capped channel that smelled. Um, so they had this you know, big old dank elevated highway, plus it smelled from the capped water. They, um, instead of doing the greenway and, and the tunnel, they created this below um, grade channel that is just this beautiful social space. At night, it's all lit up. It's lined with cafes. Um, people just really enjoy this green space. That's actually water that they divert from the river. Um, it's actually would be dry otherwise, but they just do it because it's really nice to have this, this um, water during dry season. This is what it looks like during rainy season. Mm -hmm. so, so Seoul every summer gets torrential rains. It's not quite a monsoon, but it's a tempered version of a monsoon. And you look around and people are still driving on the streets, people are still walking on the streets. 
Obviously, no, nobody goes in that channel then, but that's the idea of how do we prevent Boston from just becoming Venice mm -hmm. inadvertently. One of the options really is these below grade channels for, for uh, flood water. And you can imagine, like imagine on Long Wharf, if you elevated Long Wharf and had these beautiful tidal channels and bridges over it, it would be lovely, right? <laughs> Um, if, if it comes to that. So, you know, just as we have bike lanes, maybe we will have tide lanes. <laughs> Who knows? But, but we're going to have to be really creative to, um, to not have people have constant wet feet and shorting out electrical systems. So, so well, again, the, their Han River is similar to um, the Charles River. On either side, they have beautiful open space, some natural, some playing fields. That's the dry season. This is the rainy season. Oops. And again, you notice, Cars are still going, right? Yeah. You know, so you can imagine char the Charles looking something like that. You know, where again you're saying these are the resilient areas, these are the floodable zones that protect the infrastructure behind it. Here's another example. Um, I have a wonderful climate change um, uh, fellow named Crystal Aiken, and she came up with these, and so I'm going to have to read them because they're new to me. Um, so this is, uh, this is a picture during Hurricane Wilma of Duval Street in Key West. Mm -hmm. And um, that was the Lucky um, Beach Club. That's what the beach club looked like. It was completely flooded and destroyed. Um, it was hit by Rita and Wil Wilma. And they said, all right, how can we rebuild this better the third time? And so what they did here, this is what the beach club looks now. It is built to withstand a category 5 hurricane, which we will never get here. Um, what they did, the, the roof is a hurricane re resilient roof. The uh, shape of the roof has wind go up and over. The walls are breakaway um, walls, so if, if there's too much water, too much wind, they actually just break and maintain the overall structure. The, the wiring is up top. And so instead of having wire come from below and outlets down here, it's from up top and the outlets are up here. And if there's flooding this high, there's extra wire they can pull down and fix the outlet. So their electrical equipment is, is safer. Um, so, you know, so, and so here's an example that, you know, small amounts of flooding, they just spray wash. It's just a concrete building. This is an idea of a resilient building in a floodable zone. And they're, they're, <coughs> They are expecting more flooding. This is in Tokyo. This is called the G Cans Project. Um, this is a water storage tank. It is also called the Underground Temple. When it's not being used, it's a tourist attraction. People enjoy going going down below. Um, it is able to um, carry the water from a one in two hundred years flood to a 0.5% likelihood of, of annual flooding. Um, this takes all of the floodwaters from rivers within Tokyo and brings them down, down below. So there's a series of storage tanks. Um, and then again, it's, it's completely dry during dry seasons. It's washed out, people enjoy it. And then um, you know there's, there's staircases that go down through the silos. Um, and then in the in the rainy season, just like the Chungar Channel, it, it holds the water and keeps it away from from the rest of Tokyo. You know, and again, not tomorrow, but maybe in a hundred years, we can imagine our subways being water storage and once again having streetcars. You know, that's less disruptive than having the streets flood. So, as a nonprofit, we can think a hundred years from now. But I've been giving these presentations. I went over to Harvard. They're thinking three hundred years from now. Right? Their, their buildings are 300 years old, 200 years old. So they're starting to think about what does the Alston campus look like? Do we do temporary buildings that we then rebuild, rebuild higher up? You know, but maybe we don't do 300 year buildings in a flood zone. Right? So um, different people are looking at different, different uh, time frames. So um, these are just more kind of. Yeah, that's what that looks like. Um, additional ideas they are even more kind of fun. So this is Rotterdam. These are floating pavilions that can be moved around. 
Um, you would think that these would be recreational um, facilities, but the uh, structure is um, about 30 feet tall, 40 feet tall, and the floor area is the size of about four tennis courts. So one could imagine um, having uh, temporary floating buildings. And particularly since Boston Harbor is so protected, that's actually viable here because even during like Hurricane Nemo or, or Blizzard Nemo, it was getting 25 foot waves, we're getting two foot waves because we're so blocked by the islands and the shape of the harbor. This is called the Zander motor. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that well either, but this is um, something that's being done in Holland. Um, and they actually dumped a giant amount of sand. <laughs> like that is what that is. And it just moves around. You know, and that, and basically that um, buffers a lot of the energy of a storm and keeps it, you know, the storm is basically dealing with all this moving sand that doesn't go up and over onto um, built land. And so that is actually a, a mimicking ecology in um, decreasing the energy that's left, left to hit the land. And that just basically moves around. It's been there for a few years. It moves up and down the coast. And they're calling it the sand motor or sand engine. Um, Rotterdam, um, a lot of these are hollowed, obviously, because a lot of them are, a lot of their land is below grade. So these are below grade um, plazas. It's specifically a, a water plaza. And so excess rainwater um, is stored temporarily and it takes the pressure off their sewage system um, and then can drain once their sewage treatment plants um, have, have recovered. But meanwhile, they're wonderful play spaces. And then this is a Valencian beach boardwalk in Spain, Benidorm, Spain. And the design of this boardwalk also uh, protects the avenue behind it from waves. So it's obviously, yeah, you know, waves turn back along, you know, upon themselves. So this is this idea of living with water, right? It, it actually can be beautiful. And I want us to think about it in that way as well. So um, I think if there's one thing that I learned from working on this project is that today's 100-year flood could be an, an annual flood by mid-century and, um, and a twice daily high tide in 100 years. And, and that really does require action and, and planning. Um, that, that today what there is to do is uh, prepare emergency plans for buildings in the flood zone because we are getting more extreme storms. What scientists are saying with uh, climate change, it's not that we get more, it's not that our storms come more often, but when they come, they are more extreme because the, the heat in the system um, increases their, the energies of the storms. So that um, being in the flood zone, not all of the North End is, but if you are, um, that you want to understand your elevation and your likelihood of flooding and how you prevent water from going in your building. Um, and then that there, this is too big of an issue to either be just private sector or public sector. That we need to work together to overcome the barriers to change. You know whether that's financial or um, knowledge base. So there you are. There are a couple of questions that came in through that general queue thing that got voted up. Um, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Sure. The first question is, uh, some of the answers, like where is the flood in the North End? Uh, but why aren't we hearing more about this? OK, so flooding in the North End. The first question, I think you answered, where has there been flooding in the North End? Okay. It's supposed to have been around Fall Wharf and then flooded baseball. Yeah, fields. North End's a little bit hilly. I mean, so to the extent that it's, it's a little bit up, um, it's drier. So why have we been hearing more about it? I think, honestly, because um, until very, very recently, everybody was focusing on prevention. And so it was really Hurricane Sandy that had people start thinking about um, climate change adaptation in the short term. And will, this, will the city build like? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, nothing's off city the city building. The city built levees. How about I didn't ask the question. You <laughs> <laughs> asked the question. The, the city. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. 
there will be a third wave of public infrastructure, right? Um, you know, the big dig, the harbor cleanup. There will be some infrastructure change, right? But, um, but but in the Netherlands, they decided to stop building levees. Well, you're absolutely right. And so, I mean, and so if if they those guys know a lot more than we do. Well, if they decided not to build levees, why would we say, oh, let's build levees? Yes. So so let me let me answer your thought. It is true that there are a lot the the newer strategies tend to have these flexible zones included. I mean, the Netherlands has a lot of levees, but they're also moving towards floodable zones, you know, and so one could imagine if we ever do build seawalls, they may be actually not on the water. They may be actually between the flats and the and the elevations, right? And then you have a floodable zone between those walls and the water. This is me pulling this out of my ear. The city is not, you know, but, but you know more than we do. That's but it's just basically saying over time, how much can you control water through channeling? And then where is that barrier between floodable zone and, and an area you're trying to stay drier water? How much of the tea right now is, we got a really big storm today. How much of the tea would be really flooded? All of it. All of it. All of it. All of it. Well, well no, that's not all of it. It's no. um, so there are some low points in the tea, obviously the aquarium. Um, Orient okay. makes uh, Ken Kenmore was wood. But a they saw the, yeah, but they actually did the engineering. That was the other river. Right. Right. So, but, but I mean, right? And you know, you look like like ten more. So the short answer is, I don't know. The longer answer is, um, post Hurricane Sandy, the city, the T, um, the Department of Transportation, they are all are gathering and doing those vulnerability assessments. And, and then, then they started that in Memorial Drive. Yes. Right. right. Which doesn't require. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think the short answer is. There has been a wake-up call. Her, uh, Sandy was definitely a wake-up call. People are now in the process of doing those vulnerability assessments pretty carefully. We have 45 people running for mayor. What is the one? 45. What is the one question you would ask of a candidate? Good question. That's a great question. And um, the, st <laughs> <laughs> the, the statement. I guess so. If you let me do a statement and then maybe turn to the question. The statement is, the current mayor's staff today are running full tilt to do the right thing. So the question would be, would you commit to continuing and accelerating the good work that, the, that today's mayor's environmental staff are doing to prepare the city for climate change? That would be my question, right? Because they are on track right now. And the worry is that the new mayor will take his or her eye off the ball. Anthony. Yeah, since uh, you're talking about the team and all that stuff, since all our electrical cables are underground, what is NSTAR's preparedness in yeah, case it's flooding? Similarly. I mean, they have a terrible history with those uh, storms, snowstorms, and ice storms. Yeah. It took weeks to get power back with their poles. But over here, if you had flooding, forget the tea, all the water would go into the underground wiring, and we would have no electricity. Yeah. I mean, well, it's a, it's a great question because, I mean, somehow it's not already <coughs> flooded through rainstorms. So the question right. is, what would be the additional risk from Salt water, salt water right. flooding. And I don't know the answer to that either. I do know Brian Sweat, who's currently the um, Chief of Environmental Services um, for the city. He is gathering all the infrastructure guys, including NSTAR, including the state, you know, the T, Massport, NSTAR, um, you know, the tunnels. Um, they are all, you know, wrapping their heads around it. It takes a while. It's not like tomorrow they'll have the answer, but in 18 months they will. Right, you know, they are doing right. that modeling. And in fact, it's the same um, scientists that we use that are doing a lot of that modeling. One of the other questions that came in, Julie, was um, are there programs available for private buildings? Programs funding or, or what kind of programs? Knowledge programs? I think it's, it says money, so. Money programs? Um, not yet. I think, you know, there, there was $60 billion that was um, provided after Hurricane Sandy that mostly went to um, New York, New Jersey. Um, but, I, you know, my sense is just as, first we had the energy crisis, then came energy efficiency funding, there's got to be something like that on, you know, on the way. So, you know, when we say, okay, we have this huge effort that needs a public and private, private action, it's often cheaper provide grant programs to uh, 
to prevent rather than recover. No question. But not yet is the answer. Again, this is really a six month old, really front burner awareness. In the way? I, um, I haven't heard much about the impermeable surfaces, and it seems to me that more flow through of water and flooding would improve the, the um, resiliency of, of the area. Am I thinking? Well, in terms of coastal flooding, in terms of a city, you're not going to make that much change. Like, so you saw some of those pictures of Hurricane Sandy. When you're talking about that amount of water, it's not about permeability, per se. It's really about water storage. And there's a great guy. So you know whether it makes its way into the into the ground or into storm drains. Really, you're actually try, probably trying to get into storm drains more than anything. Um, there's a great guy at the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. He says, you know, the system always works. Water will always go somewhere, but we want it in the tunnels. Not in your basements, right? Water, water always goes up. Water always comes down. And what John says, John Sullivan, is, is that there's plenty of storage in our sewer system, and they are trying to model how to get water to the right places, right? So again, so coastal homes don't get water up in their basement, up through their toilets and drains, but rather that they're able to shunt water to empty uh, sewer pipes. But that again. Yeah, the same, same scientists working with the uh, Water and Sewer Commission. In other areas, permeability is really important. In a city like this, you're not going to get enough. It's not. It's, it's going to have to be an engineered solution here um, for the amount of water. Say that again. I don't. So, for example, Hull is an area that uh, you know, or or Dorchester. They're area that they still have natural beaches, sandy beaches, curving beaches, Nantasket yeah. Beach. Carson Beach, um, Tinian Beach, is that how you pronounce it? Um, so these beaches actually can be these natural areas that can be storm buffers. Here we're really talking about seawalls, pavement, even so permeable pavement. sandy beaches are permeable. You well, said the term permeable. Permeable is the water goes down, yeah. right? We also have a pretty high water table. So in the case of downtown Boston, you're really talking about managing water through the storm system and getting that water out to Deer Island to be treated. <laughs> so, you know, so it's gonna have it's gonna have to get through into the system more than for me. But it's a great it's a great solution for suburbs, you know, for towns, no question. You did a great job of explaining to us what Spalding did for its design and its construction. Can you give any similar examples of what privately owned residential buildings have done that you would hold mm. up as a way the rest of us should behave. Yeah, the, the next publication we want to do is really that one. Um, so, you know, this first one is sort of like, heads up, this is what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. The next one is saying, how does one do things short term, like emergency preparedness, like sandbags, right? Versus long term, like, you know, modifying the, modifying the building. So my short answer is, I don't want to guess and lead you astray. But the first thing you need to do is know what your elevation is. Right? It's part of the, the Marriott Long Wharf there was, I could see the one with the parapet walls that kind of went off the seawall. I mean, that looked like something that, that could be done, you know, around the, the Boston waterfront. That's right. And so, so yeah, so at a neighborhood level, you might think about seawalls, but poor neighborhoods next to the seawall, <laughs> they get all your water. But, you know, so um, poor Winthrop when we do everything like that. But so seawalls, you know, but low-lying seawalls, you know, if you know you're in a dip, bringing, a, you know, a seawall that brings the neighborhood up to its surroundings uh, is a good idea. But for buildings, really what you're looking for is saying, where do I care and what do I do if I do care? You know, you may be actually not very far from um, the ocean, but 10 feet up and you're fine. And you actually do nothing, right? But, but really the first thing you do is say, all right, the floodable zone today is, there's, there's actually some, you can go to um, NOAA, NOAA, um, they, and they have basically charts that they have all, there's all sorts of different um, measures they use. It's all the same thing, but they use different labels. So NAVD, North American Vertical Datum, is the same as Mid-Tide. 
since today's mint time. So you can, but you can see NAVD and say like, what the heck is mint is NAVD? Mean low, low water is roughly five feet down from mid tide. Mean high, high water is roughly five feet up from NAVD. So these are just, so we have a 10 foot range of elevation markers that people use. Based on your site plan, you figure out what is your exact elevation of your lowest <coughs> lying vulnerable point. Is it your front door, is it the basement, casement window? Find that vulnerability and say, okay, if I'm within a hundred year storm today, do I replace my first floor rug with tile? Do I move my really nice furniture up to my second floor? Do I, you know, do I move my, if I'm really, really at, at, at the um, at, ocean, at sea level, do I move my electrical outlets higher up? I mean, there's smaller things you do, but you say, if I'm really in a floodable zone, I want to make my property more resilient. resistant and resilient, right? So you, I try to keep the water out, but if it comes in, my vulnerable things are protected. So um, my father had a house on Sandal Island right on the beach. And the building codes there stipulated that the first floor could not have any electricity in it, basically. They had, you know, um, marine outlets high up, and you could not actually put any living quarters on the first floor, and the presumption was you could use it as a garage, oh. you could store boats there, because the presumption was that routinely it would, flood. it would flood, and they wanted the water to just wash through and wash back out, and so all the houses there, by phone, had to start one floor flood up. And so if you go down there, that's what you'll see. There's there's the wash through floor, which is everybody's garages, yeah. and then, um, and both storage, and then there's the building. But that's code. So I guess what I'm asking is, at what point do you think the city will be thinking about changing code for the low-lying flood districts? Because really what it requires is there to be a building code that is that forces you to think about resilience, that's right. right? Because that's what that code does. It, it's all about resilience. It doesn't say you can't build on the beach. It says you just can't put living quarters on the first floor. That's, that's right. That's right. And um, short term, the city is looking at building codes. I think they're more focused on the big new commercial buildings than residents. But yeah, I think there's going to be building codes that um, will affect the flood. The, uh, the flood zone, yeah, um, and I think the idea is basically it's always cheaper to prevent them to recover. Um, but you know the idea of, you know, today it's really about emergency preparedness. In a hundred years, we may, we may well see something like that. You know, where the first floor is a floodable floor everywhere. You know, so it's it's really something that we will change over time. And you basically say, where do I invest? You know, knowing that this is not a one, knowing that this is not about tornadoes or hurricanes, where it's like a one-shot deal and you have no increased risk over time. We have an increased risk over time. Where do we invest to to maintain the livability or enhance the livability of Boston while diminishing our flood uh, risk or catastrophic flood damage risk? Right, which is really what they're talking about. Other questions for Julie? Sure. Um. In New York, their proposal for climate change has a $20 billion budget. I'm wondering whether or not in the next one that you say is going to be done, will it have costs associated with it as well? So we get an idea of how much money it's going to cost. So what I'm talking about is really way ahead of what the city's thinking. Nobody in the city is saying we're going to have a third wave of investment. But New York City has 500 miles of coastline, we have 50. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a different scale of problem. Well, so the property values are. It's Wall Street, it's Manhattan, right? Yes. You know, so, so they have a different scale of problem than we do. Um, the whole harbor cleanup was less than $5 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. The big dig went way over cost, and that was between 14 and 23 billion dollars if you factor in interest or not so you know we may have something some some fraction of that 
But I think, you know, when people, oftentimes, or the most, the most common <coughs> comment I've had at um, presentations is, why don't we just do that CDM across the islands? And that would be at like a 20 billion. I don't know if it'd be 20 billion. Oh, but you can't do it for 20 billion dollars, and it doesn't work. Well, the issue <laughs> is that even if you did, one at one, yeah, one day it'll overtop, and then you haven't had the spent the money. People think you could just slam down a bunch of concrete, but it, it doesn't work. This is a silly question, but isn't the big dig going to be our big storage tank? Yeah. <laughs> and when the water comes up and all the power is gone and all the water flows down Fulton Street and down Canal Street, it goes into the tunnel. Right, right. I mean, it'll be flooded and they won't be able to use it, but too bad for them, they can't drive through our city. Well, but it'll get the like, water off our streets. I mean, it could be maybe one day. Yeah. It's just like you saw the Tokyo thing in Japan, solution. yeah. It may be that we don't have to build a Tokyo solution. No, we already have it. Yeah. I can relax now for a hundred years. But, you know, but again, exactly. But I mean, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, some of the things I'm talking about are really far off. Right. But it's not far off to start planning it because, you know, every infrastructure change takes 25 years. And so for it's going to be cheaper and better the sooner we start to think about it, you know, so that we are able to incorporate our social values into it, mm -hmm. not just sort of the got to do it, got to get the engineers in there, boom. That's, you know, and, and I guess my analogy is right after 9-11, we had all these really ugly Jersey barriers that protected our building. Now we have all these really beautiful sculptural gardens and, and, and planters that also protect our buildings from car bombs. But there's no longer this sense of like being under siege. They're just there, right? And so given that this is not something like tornadoes, you know, that, that you just, it's just really hard to prepare for a tornado, this is something that we need to adapt to over time. And or we, earthquakes. Or earthquakes. We don't you know, deal when with you have like, when you have like, who knows when it's going to come and it's really catastrophic when it does, much harder to build in that planning. This is something that we, you know, Seattle actually is, they built their um, streets up a block up. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but they were flooding. And you can take a tour of, of downtown Seattle and go, you know, a street level below ground, because they actually did that. They're on a hill, it's not as much land, but over a century, maybe that's what Boston will look like, is we'll just mm -hmm. knock off our first floor. I don't know, but I, I want, yeah, who knows? But you know, I guess what I want to say is, um, we do our best thinking when we're thinking through creativity and joy, not through sort of reptile brain panic. <laughs> <laughs> I want us to think about livability as we are adapting to this challenge. So. Dan, as you move forward in time and these uh, floods become a twice a day event, um, the financial district and areas of commercial in Fulton and Quincy Market are within that area that's very low and very floodable. You're talking about maybe not being able to drive through the city or store a motor vehicle twice a day. How, how do you get around a problem like that? Well, I mean, I actually do really like this idea of these channels. So, um, so maybe zip car can have zip boats. I mean, I think, you know, so the maps are if we do nothing and everything is the same, great. I think one of the solutions very well could be below grade infrastructure like this, whether it is open or or not. You know, taking over some portion of downtown to um, channel water, whether it's channel tidal water or partially channel storm water. Seoul is fully functioning, right? You know, but they've channeled that water. And I think that one of our solutions is going to be something like that. Well, Star Drive already is. Who <laughs> <laughs> needs Morrissey Boulevard, right? It's already. <laughs> so, so, you know, to the extent that we have parallel road infrastructure, it may well be that some roads drop down, some roads go up. Right. You know, one, again, John Sullivan of the Water and Sewer Commission, he's their chief engineer, and I've learned more from him about this kind of thing. He said, what if you had some of our surface roads, whether it's cross street, whether it's Atlantic Ave, whether it's um, Seaport Boulevard, if those are elevated a few feet, 
and it protects everything behind it, right? And then you have a floatable zone of a block or two. Mm -hmm. There are different things you can do that are a lot less disruptive than a big levy. Mm -hmm. So, but I think there are multiple solutions. You're just trying to uh, plan to a performance standard, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and see how you can do it with the least disruption and the least cost. Well, we're close to our hard stop. At, at <laughs> at Bruin time. Thanks very much to <laughs> <laughs>